So you're either watching this video because you think the sleek wedge design of the 300ZX looks cool with those slanted headlights. Hey bro, you know my car has the same headlights as a Diablo, man? That's so sick. And you haven't figured out the biggest flaw of this car is that they're hard to work on, or you've accepted that fact and you still want to get one, which is a cool decision because you want to be different. In this video, we're going to go over the differences between the trims and the years. We're going to go over the common problems these cars have. I'm going to tell you what items on the car to look out for that are rarer than normal and can add value to the car. And last but not least, I'll tell you about the top five rarest colors you can get for this car so you can stand out even a little bit more than already owning a Z32 300ZX. So there's two different trims for this car that you need to know about, and they are naturally aspirated and twin turbo. Now the twin turbo not only has a better engine, obviously but it also has a lot of cosmetic stuff so these are the differences that a twin turbo 300 zx has over an na 300 zx turbo trim has a standard rear spoiler so you don't have to option for it slotted front bumper to allow more air to come in wider wheels um, and it also has a boost gauge under the speedometer so if you're a novice at cars and you don't know what a turbo looks like just go look at the cluster and you'll know if it's a tt car it also has a different rear differential that has a higher gear ratio and it also has better injectors and one of my favorite things that the tt version has over the na is four-wheel steering i wish more cars had it the only other car i could think of that had it is the dodge style twin turbo and the 3000 gt vr4 i mean there's not that many cars that have it and the ones that are due are badass if i was going to list everything i'd be here all day but pretty much much everything on the twin turbo is better than the NA counterpart. TT300ZX makes 300 horsepower and 283 foot-pounds of torque, while the NA version makes 222 horsepower and only 198 foot-pounds of torque. Now we're going to go into the differences between the years. The first model year was 1990. In 1990, there was no airbag offered, making the gauge cluster unique. It had manual climate controls offered on the TT model. It had no emblem on the nose panel, and instead it had a full Nissan logo on the front bumper. And sales this year were 39,290 units. Starting in 1991, they had a new electronic climate control, so it was no longer manual, and there was also no more ambient temp gauge. Nissan decided to put their logo on the front because that's good advertising. And this is the year if you're thinking about safety, the first year to look into because you had an option to get a driver's side airbag. The air conditioning was a little bit quieter in the new ones. Like it's so, so loud. Compared to the 1990 model, a CD player was now optional for the TT model before there was, there was no CD player in the TT. And sales for this year were 17,652. 1992 had standard airbags, the dashboard and the doorboard material changed from fabric to suede, which is a nice upgrade. And if you care about luxuries, you get power adjusted driver's seats standard in the TT version. In 1993, they fixed a problem with the turbos for heat dissipation. A convertible top was offered if you like some wind in your hair, possibly female. The brake caliper material changed from aluminum to iron, helping with the warpage and the shimmy problems from the previous years. It had better injectors for the NA models that were less prone to premature failure. You got an upgraded Bose stereo system, made standard. And this year, they managed to sell 11,599 units. For 1994, you got a taller rear spoiler for all my hot boys out there. The Super Hika system changed to an electrically actuated unit. New style fuel injectors for the convertible model. And if you care about your girlfriend's safety, then this is the first year to get because passenger airbags were introduced this year. Another luxury was added, keyless entry. The titanium keys are discontinued this year. Uh, which kind of sucks. And year by year, the sales are getting less and they only sold 5,320 units. For 1995, they can't figure out what style of fuel injector to make, so they updated again with the new style for the twin turbo model. The front fascia of the car became body colored instead of that gray strip. For 1996, this was the last year that was offered in the US. They dropped the variable cam timing. OBD2 was introduced, which is very nice to have if there's something wrong with your car. So this is definitely a one to look into. They dropped the adjustable side bolsters in the driver's seat and sales for this year were 2,929 making this the rarest year out of all of them. The last 300 of them were a special edition, which I'll talk about later. And if you're outside of the US and still looking for a Z32 300ZX, the 1997 and plus model all had the TT front fascia. And then in 1998, till the end of the Z32, you had a new front fascia, new side skirts, new taillights, new center panel, new spoiler, and gold light for the gauge cluster. How luxurious. And they also revised the manual transmission, which helped with the stigma for the transmission of soft synchros. They made the synchro stronger just for you guys outside of the US. Now that we got the differences between the trims out of the way and the years, let's go on to the things that go wrong most often. First being that the wiring harnesses on these cars go bad, so make sure everything works. 
A lot of people say that if a car doesn't run, make sure to check for fuel, air, and spark. I think that's right, but at the same time, you're missing a big component, and that is wiring harnesses. I mean, I've, I've had to deal with these for the last two years on my A86 Corolla, so make sure to make sure that the wiring harnesses all work. Like I was stating earlier in the video, the earlier years, Z32s, having a problem with their injectors, causing them to fail early. If the car that you're looking at is misfiring, you may just need to change them out for some new ones. The brakes on these cars tend to squeal and an easy fix for this is getting some anti-spool brake components because they are a necessity for these cars like every car that has t-tops the t-tops will leak you need to replace the seal which is a great way to get the price down on the car you're looking at because most likely they will leak if you're hearing a rattling from the engine this is your vtc springs located at the front of the cams some reasons for them rattling can be worn out springs oil pressure being low or a bad vts solenoid when you're test driving the car make sure to see that the boost gauge is reading negative 14 at warm idle and when you're stomping on the pedal the boost gauge should read around 9 psi of boost when you're circling around the car looking for us these are the most common places the rocker panels around the toolkit underneath the battery above the rear wheels behind the rear bumper and under the motor mounts now that we got all of that out of the way we'll move on to the things that add value to the car obviously if the car has one of those later gen spoilers it's going to be worth a little bit more so if you find one of those on the car you kind of know you're already getting a deal if it's for the same price as one without the wing but there's a couple versions of this car that are super rare that i want to talk to you guys about because if you find one of these in your neighbor john's garage and he doesn't know what he has you have to automatically buy it because these are the top tier z32s to get starting off at 1990 motorsports international of waco texas which is very close to me teamed up with somebody you all know already hks and made the SR71 300ZX, which is one hell of a name because it sounds like a race car. It featured larger turbos, a Camaro body kit, and HKS electronics. They were only sold in a small amount of dealerships inside the United States, so you can find one of these here. And the special edition of the Z32 was claimed to be the third fastest production car in the world in 1990. And another special edition that you should be looking out for is a 1995 and 1996, the SMZ300ZX. This was made by Steve Millen. He was a longtime Nissan racer. This was a $14,000 option from the dealer. And what was different about it from a regular 300ZX was a bigger wing, some front bumper revisions, new side skirts, and a revised rear bumper. You also got an exhaust made by Stillen and a few extra pounds of boost that up the SMZ by 65 horsepower. And like I was talking about earlier, the last special edition I want to tell you guys about is the last 300 of these made. This was called the commemorative edition. They have a plaque on the center console identifying them with the number that they are out of 300. And if you find one of these, that is a serious barn find if the guy does not know what he has. Only 78 of these were twin turbos, so finding a twin turbo edition is even more rare. I mean, you're only one out of 78 in the US. And the last thing we're going to cover in this video is the five rarest colors. Now, usually I say there's no specific order, but in this video, I have the actual production numbers and percentages of these colors. So this will be in order. The top five USD colors you could get on a Z32. Starting off with 1.36% and only 1,216 made is the Black Emerald. I've talked about this in other videos, but it's just like that perfect green that you want. And not that many cars nowadays have this color, so it just reminds you of the 90s and the early 2000s when I see this color. Matched with a tan interior, and this car is golden. Next on the list, we have Gold Pearl. The percentage of this one was 1.35%, and only 1,206 of these were made. This reminds me of a late 90s, early 2000s Camry, because like almost every Camry was golden back then. Um, but it is a beautiful color for this car and it really does make it shine. You know, I always wonder since it's so low production numbers, who decided to buy this color out of all of the rest of the colors? And I think definitely this suits like a businessman. The third rarest color is going to be Oxford Gray Metallic. And honestly, I have no idea why this one is rare. I mean, only 1,118 of these were made, accumulating for 1.25% of the total sales in the US. And it just looks like a normal gray to me. Uh, maybe there was a better gray at the time, who knows, but uh, it's just really nothing special compared to the other colors you've seen on this list so far. The second rarest color on this list is Deep Purple Metallic. I love purple, and it's actually my favorite color. 
Um, I love that Dodge always has the plum purple in all of their muscle cars, and I really wish other car companies would do the same and follow with different shades of purple. I mean, right now in wrap, one of the most popular colors is this exact type of purple to put on your car. Only 216 of these were made, and this accumulated for less than 1%, 0.24%. This right here would be my favorite color for this car if I would ever get one of these. And the number one rarest color on this list is Cocoa Bronze Metallic, also known as the poopy color. I'm just kidding, I just made that up, but uh, it's just a light brown paint color. Uh, it does look pretty good. I like it with the tan interior too, just like the green. But uh, it, for being the rarest color, I don't think it is that special. So I hope you guys did enjoy this video. Make sure to leave a like, join the Discord, and comment down below. If you want a buyer's guide on a different car, let me know in the comments, and I will definitely make a video on the car you comment on. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace out.